This video is going to wrap up our heme talk. Now we talked about two little coagulation factors. Now we're going to talk about when you have too much. Just to recap, things that regulate our coagulation factors are going to be things like protein C and S. Protein C, if you recall, has affinity for the, the coagulation factors that act as cofactors, so 8 and 5. And then protein S is just kind of its helper. Something else we have, antithrombin 3. That's the thing that works on a lot of coagulation factors, but namely 10 and 2, thrombin. So 10 and 2. Those are just the things that regulate it. Now, just a recap now to the meat of our discussion, and that is what disorders can cause increased coagulation factors. These disorders are called hereditary thrombosis syndromes. So judging by the name, a lot of them are hereditary, so you inherit them. And then when you have too much coagulation factors, you have too much coagulation, you'll have thrombus forming, and thrombi, that's where thrombosis comes from. Suspect this in any young patient that has a history of thromboembolytic events, so DVT, pulmonary embolism, etc. So young patients with thrombies, and there aren't too many of them, only four, so you have factor five leading. You're gonna have protein CS deficiency, antithrombin three deficiency, and something called prothrombin mutation. Let's see if we can figure these out. Factor five leading. This is due to this is due to a mutation in factor five. And it's very common in white patients. So if a young white patient comes in and has a history of thromboemolytic events, you're thinking factor five leading. This mutation in the gene turns a guanine base into an adenine base, so guanine and adenine. And by doing that, you change the codon, the amino acid it's supposed to code for. And that goes from arginine to glutamate. That small change makes factor five very resilient to being broken down. What breaks down factor five would be protein C and S. So protein C and S can no longer break down factor five. Factor five increases, you get your thrombi. Pretty straightforward there. Protein C and S deficiency. Self-explanatory, if you don't have protein C and S, you can't break down our cofactors eight and five. Okay. So eight and five increase. And it's highly associated with warfarin skin necrosis. Why is that? Can you figure that out? What's the mechanism of warfarin skin necrosis? When you give warfarin, you inhibit vitamin K dependent factors like two, seven, nine, ten, C, S. And I said that CNS has the shortest half-life, so those go down first. And for a brief moment in time, you have nothing but these factors, nothing but coagulation factors and nothing to regulate them. So for a brief moment in time, you're hypercoagulable. You have increased chances of thrombi and you can get skin necrosis. If you have a CNS deficiency like in here, those decrease even quicker. And that's why it's highly associated with warfarin skin necrosis. So always link those two together. You give someone warfarin, they develop skin necrosis, or I show you a picture of skin necrosis. Always link protein C and S deficiency. And know the mechanism. That's warfarin skin necrosis. Antithrombin 3 deficiency. You don't have antithrombin 3, you can't work on many factors, but in particular 2 and 10. What drug works on antithrombin 3? That'd be your heparin. Heparin works on it. So if you're deficient in antithrombin 3, then heparin won't work as well. And so you'll give heparin and you'll monitor heparin use. What test do we use to monitor heparin use? Hopefully everything's coming back. This is like a nice recap video. That'd be your PTT, your intrinsic pathway. So you'll monitor with heparin use. You'll give, you'll give heparin, hoping to see a change in PTT. It won't change. So you'll give a little bit more. Won't change. Give a little bit more, 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 and then it'll change. 
then you'll finally overcome that deficiency. So if you give a patient heparin and you're not seeing a change in PTT like you, like you suspect, then you're thinking AT3 deficiency, antithrombin 3 deficiency. Comprende. One thing it's associated with is nephrotic syndrome. Hopefully you'll remember in our renal block, we said nephrotic syndrome, you lose a lot of proteins, you can lose immunoglobulins, you can also lose antithrombin 3. They really like to put an emphasis on antithrombin 3 because it increases you for hypercoag. We talked in our last video, it also increases your chance for DIC. Yeah. So no, nephrotic syndromes lose AT3 commonly. Make a little star. Last but not least, prothrombin mutations. This is a mutation in your prothrombin gene. Makes prothrombin increase in expression. If that increases, then thrombin increases. If that increases, then clots increase. And that's how it causes increased thrombi. That does it for this video. That does it for heme. Hope you enjoyed. We just have, we just have one more video. That's our, we're at our home stretch. Till then, thanks.